This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So, uh, welcome to uh, the Anti-Capitalist uh, Chronicles. Uh, and uh, as usual, uh, these are being, being constructed from uh, uh, a lockdown position in my uh, uh, small sort of uh, apartment, but uh, something astonishing happened in the apartment. I have a, a succulent that I've had for a long time and I never knew it would have a flower. And now suddenly uh, I find myself with this uh, rather astonishing and uh, rather uh, interesting uh, flower which uh, has uh, suddenly appeared. And uh, you know, it's rather, it's rather lovely to have it. So astonishing things can happen inside of apartments, uh, even though it is in the middle of uh, lockdown. And uh, so uh, this is a cause for some celebration. I thought that uh, I would like to try something today, which uh, I haven't really tried before, which is uh, to actually take a couple of pieces of uh, text from Marx's uh, Grundrisse and uh, sort of try to spin together uh, an image of what kind of world we are living in from these uh, two uh, passages. Uh, they're rather different from each other, and at first sight it seems like uh, they're inconsistent with each other, and therefore you ask the question of why these two statements exist in this uh, same text, some uh, 80 pages apart, but uh, they do. But I think actually some very important insights about uh, the present and the future, and maybe also about the, the past come out of uh, consideration of these uh, two texts. So I'm going to uh, read them to you and then uh, sort of comment on them and spin a little story uh, out, of, out, uh, out of them. The uh, first text uh, comes from uh, around page 409 uh, to 10 of uh, the Grundrisse, for those of you who are interested in checking on references and all the rest of it, and it reads as follows. Capital creates the bourgeois society and the universal appropriation of nature, as well as of the social bond itself by the members of society. Hence, the great civilizing influence of capital, its production of a stage of society in comparison to which all earlier ones appear as mere local developments of humanity and as nature idolatry. For the first time, nature becomes purely an object for humankind, purely a matter of utility, ceases to be recognized as a power for itself and for the theoretical discovery of its autonomous laws this appears merely as a ruse, so as to subjugate it under human needs, whether as an object of consumption or as a means of production. In accord with this tendency, capital drives beyond national barriers and prejudices, as much as, much as beyond nature worship, as well as all traditional, confined, complacent, encrusted satisfactions of present needs and reproductions of old ways of life. It is destructive towards all of this and constantly revolutionizes it, tearing down all the barriers which hem in the development of the forces of production, the expansion of needs, the all-sided development of production, and the exploitation and exchange of natural and mental forces. This is a very good description of what uh, Schumpeter later referred to as a creative destruction, the creative destruction of uh, capital and it's very much about the creativity and uh, Marx sees this as a civilizing influence. So you wonder why it is that Marx, the preeminent anti-capitalist, would be in a sense singing the praises of capital as a civilizing influence, as opening up the whole of humanity to a different perspective on the world, uh, to overcoming national barriers and prejudices. Uh, and constantly revolutionizing the world in which we live and therefore creating opportunities in ways which are absolutely uh, 
uh, if you like, limitless in terms of their potentiality uh, for human uh, development. So it's a, it's a remarkable passage. And the Grundrisse is full of kind of remarkable passages of this kind that has these kind of jewel-like uh, representations which emerge. So this is, if you like, a picture of what capital is doing to the world and how it operates and w what it might be about. And that's what you read on page 409 to 10. But then you go to page 488 and you get a very different description of what capital is about. And this is somewhat longer, but uh, this is the contrast that I, that I want to work with. And he says this, the old view in which the human being appears as the aim of production, regardless of his limited national, religious, political character, seems to be very lofty when contrasted to the modern world, where production appears as the aim of mankind and wealth as the aim of production. In fact, however, when the limited bourgeois form is stripped away, what is wealth other than the universality of individual needs, capacities, pleasures, productive forces, etc., created through universal exchange? The full development of human mastery over the forces of nature, those of so-called nature, as well as, as of humanity's own nature. The absolute working out of his creative potentialities with no presupposition other than the previous historic development, which makes this totality of development, i.e. the development of all human powers, as such the end in itself, not as measured on a predetermined yardstick. Where he does not reproduce himself in one specificity, but produces his totality, strives not to remain something he has become, but is in the absolute movement of becoming. In bourgeois economics, and in the epoch of production to which it corresponds, this complete working out of the human content appears as a complete emptying out. This universal objectification as total alienation. And the tearing down of all limited one-sided aims as sacrifice of the human end in itself to an entirely external end. This is why the childish world of antiquity appears on one side as loftier. On the other side, it really is loftier in all matters where closed shapes, forms, and given limits are sought for. It is satisfaction from a limited standpoint, while the modern gives no satisfaction, or where it appears satisfy, satisfied with itself, it is vulgar. This is a very different account of what capital is about. Capital is about the barrier. It's creating something which is preventing the absolute movement of becoming, preventing the achievement of the sort of civilizing capacities that are described in the first quote. So here capital is the barrier. Uh, there in the first one it was a creative force. So what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing in a world where we're constantly uh, living in the midst of this creative force, or are we living in this world where the creativity is frustrated at every minute, where, as Mick, Mick Jagger might sing, I can't get no satisfaction. And why is it that this capacity for a civilizing influence and for creativity is converted under capital into an emptying out, into universal alienation. Why does that happen? And what kind of world are we living in? So I, I, I was thinking about this and, and sort of sitting back and saying, well, here you have these two descriptions. Which one really accords with what I see going on around me right now? And how are we going to actually give an account of what is going on around us right now, drawing upon one or other of these descriptions. Take the first description, which is about the creativity and what about the possibility and the opening up and the constantly revolutionizing and the creation of a, of a, of a universal culture, the creation of uh, 
uh, universal objective being, all, all of that. And I think about that and I think to myself, you know, I, what is impressive about the current situation is when I go into the supermarket, I see a cornucopia of things to buy, of different foods to eat. We have a, a, an Armenian store not too far from where I live where almost every food grain in the world is represented. Where almost every kind of hot pepper, every kind of spice, every kind, I mean, I, I mean, it, it's astonishing. And you go into just an ordinary store and you see wines from all over the world and you'll see cheeses from all over the world. Now, when I first came to the United States in 1969, when you went into the supermarket or you went into some place, you know, where you might be able to buy liquor, uh, the only wine you could find in the, in the city of Baltimore, from, with the exception of one particular shop, the only wine you could buy was California jug wine, and that was it. The only cheese you could buy was Wisconsin cheese, and it was all sort of pretty much the same, sometimes a little bit uh, spicier than other times. If you were ever interested in something like uh, Italian cheese and you wanted really authentic Parmesan or you wanted uh, a brie or a French cheese, you couldn't find it anywhere. Now I go into my local supermarket and yes, okay, I live in a, a neighborhood where it's upscale enough so it uh, does actually uh, have these things. And the selection of cheeses is enormous. The selection of wines is enormous. The technologies which are around are absolutely fantastic right now. I took a car ride the other day and the car ride had a GPS system and we wanted to go from point A to an address point B and the address system just told us, you know, turn right here, go left here, go up there and then you, you, you get to your place. You don't have to consult a map, have to worry about whether you've taken the right turn and read the map right and all this kind of stuff. I mean. Then you look at the medical side of things, the, 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 the new drugs that are available for all sorts of things. In fact, some of them are very spurious and we could probably do with about you know, one third of them. But nevertheless, the technical kind of configuration and you have artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I, I have a, a, an Alexa system and so I can play any music from almost any tradition I want on the Alexa system. I mean, this is an astonishing world. It really is an astonishing world and you're looking at it and you're kind of saying, this is, this is just, just remarkable. It is remarkable. And that first description, which is talking about the civilizing influence, the breaking it down of all these barriers, the capacity to travel. In the 1960s, you know, to travel once in a year abroad was kind of considered a, 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 a pretty astonishing thing. Now, I, well, not now, of course, but until recently, I was, I was traveling all over the place. And, and so it is, it's, it's a radically different world to, to what it was. And I think that first, first description captures much of that that is going on. So I kind of say to myself, well, I actually, I don't believe in that second description, which is all sort of doom and gloom about the emptying out and the universal alienation and all of that. I don't believe it because the pleasures are there to be taken. And yeah, okay, I can afford the pleasures and many people can't, but actually even ordinary people can afford some minimal pleasures. And there, it is an astonishing, astonishing set of, of capacities and powers that capital has created. And it is capital that's created it. Now, whether you want to call it a civilizing influence or not is an interesting sort of question, but nevertheless, it's, it's there. And, and I, I'm you know, very, very impressed uh, with, with that first description to say, yeah, that's a description of the world that I'm in. But then I turn to the second description and I think about the emptying out, the emptiness, the universal alienation. And I think about the, the barriers and how it is that wealth which Marx starts to describe in the second description as, as a whole panoply of satisfactions and joys and all the rest of it, has been reduced in a capitalist society to monetary wealth. And there's only one thing you are interested in, and the whole society is orchestrated around the question of monetary wealth. And it becomes such a, 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 an astonishing thing. And I think of, of the only measure 
of well-being that matters to Donald Trump is, is, is the stock market going up. And of course, the stock market is irrelevant to the qualities of daily life. And then you think about the qualities of daily life and you think about the misery and the fact that people cannot get any satisfaction. There has been three, four, five de decades now of what I would call compensatory consumerism up the wazoo. It's just you know, astonishing. But it hasn't compensated. It hasn't satisfied. And what have we got? We've got universal alienation. We've got suicide, a real suicide as a global problem. Suicides of peasant cultivators in India, suicides of, of, of rice farmers in, uh, in, in, in South Korea, suicides and opioid epidemics and deaths from opioids in Ohio and Pennsylvania and all of those abandoned industrial communities. We, I mean, the second, the second description is there also. So we're living in these two worlds. And the second description is not an inadequate description. In fact, it's a very powerful description of this realm and world of possibilities, which is constantly being de destroyed, if you like, precisely by that which it has done in the first description, which is to civilize society in certain kinds of ways. So it civilizes at the same time as it fails to satisfy. It creates a misery. And even in the midst of all of this potential wealth, all of this potential capacity, and all of the all, all of the, the cornucopia of possibilities right now and 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 this if you like seems to me to be the central one of the, the central social dilemma of of what capital accumulation is is about in our times and i think that therefore instead of sort of saying well it's either the first description or the second description we have to i think put them together and say this when you conjoin them provides us with an astonishing, uh, I think, way of understanding the point to which capital has arrived in terms of its history, that it has done the civilizing thing and, and, and done it remarkably well. And therefore, you know, as Marx himself at various points says, we should say thank you very much, but it's time for you move out of the way and give way to something else. And to give way to something else means to address the emptiness, to address the universal alienation, to address the fact that capital is a barrier. And when you kind of start to ask the question, what is Marx talking about, about with this barrier? Uh, when he talks about the absolute movement of becoming, that we as individuals have capacities and powers and possibilities and, 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 and realize those capacities and that there is a way of talking about wealth as a realization of our capacities and, and, our, and our well-being and to engage in what he calls here the absolute movement of becoming and contrast that absolute movement possibility of that absolute movement of becoming with this total alienation and when he talks about this limited one-sided aims of capital that is the the the, the sort of concern and and with with with, with stock market values and, and these one-sided aims which sacrifice he says the human end in itself to an entirely external end now one of the things that marx does is to talk about the way in which capital is produced by labor and labor in effect produces the instrument of its own oppression and having produced the instrument of its own oppression it then has to live with its own oppression and that becomes a powerful abstraction and marx talks in the grundrisse about how we are all of us subject to abstractions that is we're all governed by abstractions the stock market goes up and we behave in a certain way the stock market starts to crash and everything has to give way for reviving it because that is the crucial question in society, no matter what the human cost. And this is the point that Marx is making here. No matter what the human cost, the abstraction is, is working us into a situation where it is sacrificing the capacity of humanity, own development being an end in itself 
and it's no longer an end in itself because it's sacrificed before stock market values. Now, interestingly, the capitalist class has started to recognize this as a problem. So they've set up these committees and, you know, the high CEOs and all the rest of it to kind of say, you know, we've been focused far too much through the last 30 or 40 years on stock market values. We should be concerned with social qualities of life. We should be concerned with environmental issues. We should be concerned with these things. We should have what they start to talk about as a conscience capitalism. And so they started to talk about this and they signed declarations of good intent and all this kind of thing. And there was an interesting sort of survey the other day saying, OK, let's look at all those corporations and the CEOs that signed this letter of good intent about, you know, getting out of stock market values and let's see what they've done. Well, they've done nothing. But Marx's point would be to say they can't do anything because they are governed by abstraction. And the abstraction is, of course, the profit rate. And yes, the abstraction is stock market value. The abstraction is the laws of motion of capital, which are forcing them into certain modes of behavior. And they don't have any choice. So the point here is this, that when Marx then goes on to say the childish world of antiquity appears on one side as loftier, he earlier on kind of said, you know, the aim, the aim of, of activity in a peasant society is not stock market value, it's the reproduction of our human life. And it's a limited aim. But on the other hand, to the degree that a peasant society can actually reproduce its conditions of existence and can uh, acquire a certain kind of comfortable level of existence, it, it, is, it is satisfying in its own right it doesn't have to satisfy any, any rules of the market. It doesn't have to satisfy. And it therefore can have completely different ways of valuing human life and, and valuing what it is that they are doing and why they're doing it. And actually, he then said, kind of says about uh, ancient Rome and Greece and this kind of said, and said, well, you know, one of the aims of those societies was, wasn't the accumulation of uh, gold, although it was rather more significant than Marx, I think, was willing to, to, to admit. It was the creation of good citizens. Now, it, wouldn't it be interesting if we lived in a world where the, where the aim of productive activities and the aim of consumption and the aim of, uh, of all economic activity was the creation of good citizens? Well, of course, we can define what is a good citizen. A good citizen under neoliberalism is defined as somebody who makes absolutely no claims upon the state. That's the definition of good citizenship. That is, you have to be independent and autonomous, and that means you're a good citizen because you don't trouble the state. If you trouble the state, you're a bad citizen. But Marx then kind of, in his kind of definition, kind of says, well, once, once, once there was a time in which people were actually Cult, trying to cultivate civic values, and civic values were important. And there have been periods where that notion of civic value has actually crept back into capitalism. For instance, uh, some of the, the, the bourgeois reformers of the 19th century in urban areas, like uh, Joseph Chamberlain in, uh, uh, in, in, in Birmingham in the sort of the 1860s, 1870s, they, they were trying to actually create a world in which civic virtue meant something. But of course, it's very difficult right now to create a world of civic virtue. And this is the moment of the pandemic is a point where civic virtue would, in fact, be critical. And to some degree, what we've seen is the actual manifestation of civic virtue in terms of the first responders who are out there dealing with the virus on the front lines. And that was a different kind of virtue. But of course, that's nothing to do with the stock market. And are they going to be appreciated? Are we going to reorganize production? And are we going to reorganize consumption to, to, to actually validate the civic virtue of those who went out and actually made the society work and lived the, the way? Our way? So this second d description is heavily, weighs heavily upon us. And I think that when Marx sets this out in the way he has, he's given us this way of thinking about the nature of capital and actually suggested to us that yes it is this has this creative capacity 
It does these, these, these fantastic things. It breaks through barriers. It revolutionizes things. It's constantly changing labor productivity and rev making revolutions in uh, the means of production and in, in the productive forces. And at the same time, it's also opening up the possibility for the structuring of new ways of uh, dealing with social relations and, 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 and production of a different kind of quality of daily life. It's doing all of those things, but it's doing them in a way which is unsatisfactory and, 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 and is failing in terms of delivering satisfaction. It's delivering all of these kinds of things to us in, 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 these, in this way, which is not uh, adequate and is not adequate to, to human aspirations. And the denial of human aspirations is leaving, leading us into a world where in the advanced capitalist countries, we're not talking about the impoverished world, in the advanced capitalist countries, we're creating a world where life expectancy is diminishing, where satisfactions are, 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 are falling apart, even in the midst of these fantastic possibilities which exist. And then we kind of say, what is it we should be doing about it? Now, there's one other thing about these two quotes, which, which I think is significant. And I, should have to I have to deal with them because uh, they are particularly significant in our time. Because in both of these quotes, what you will find Marx doing is to saying, we've moved to a situation where we can master nature, dominate nature. And there's a language here which is an awkward language and one which I find difficult and I'm sure many of you will find difficult, which is this idea of a domination of nature. And it is an extremely uh, anthropocentric uh, understanding and, and, and therefore uh, you would want to say, well, is this uh, what we would want to, to believe in? Now, there are, there, are, there, are, there are three things here which I think are, 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 are significant. And I always think it's important to do this when reading Marx. When Marx makes a comment like, uh, okay, uh, I'm, let's take the, the first quote, that, the, that this, this world is about the universal appropriation of nature. And the state that we are in a stage of society where for the first time nature becomes purely an object for humankind, purely a matter of utility, ceases to be recognized as power for itself. And the theoretical discovery of its autonomous laws appears merely as a ruse so as to subjugate it under human needs, whether as an object of consumption or as a means of production. Now, is this Marx saying this is a good thing? Or is this Marx reporting to us that this is what capital does? And this is what capital must do. And, and I think the first point I would want to make is Marx here is talking about the creation of a bourgeois society and what the nature of that bourgeois society is about. And he's saying the nature of a capitalist bourgeois society is that it must rest upon the subjugation of nature. Now, we all know that that's run into some very serious problems. Uh, even in Marx's time, there were, 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 were some of these. So it's one thing to say, uh, hey, this is a great thing, that the subjugation of nature, finally we've got it pinned down and we can do what we want with it, and that therefore uh, the idea of socialism would not dispute that. It would actually take it over and continue with it. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing in society to say, Bourgeois society is creative in certain ways, but one part of its creativity is that it is going to actually rest upon the subjugation of nature and the deployment of science to subdue nature. And I would want to argue here that Marx is, is saying that that is something which is necessary for a capitalist mode of production. But there is then an interesting kind of question of to what degree are we socialists and others and anti-capitalists uh, going to take advantage of this? And of course, there is a whole wing of eco-socialist thought and ecologic, deep ecology and all the rest of it that would dispute from its very ground, ontological ground, that this is an adequate way of description of the world. 
And I've been asked whether I think Marx was really uh, anthropocentric in the way that's suggested here. And I think to some degree he was. But anthropocentrism doesn't necessarily mean that you be behave irresponsibly in relationship to the environment that surrounds you. So there are forms of anthropocentrism that would say, well, actually nurturing nature, taking responsibility for nature, as John Passmore wrote a book about that, uh, is, is in fact an anthropocentric position, but it's not one which rests upon extractive uh, behaviors. It's one that can rest upon uh, looking after uh, the environment, making uh, the, the world uh, a, a flourishing, uh, ecologically flourishing, because an ecologically flourishing world is a world which is much more satisfying for human beings to live in. In other words, part of the lack of satisfaction in the contemporary world is precisely because modernity, the domination of nature, has led to a world where not only do we have universal uh, alienation from the productive processes and political processes and, and social solidarities and all the rest of it, we also have universal alienation in our relation to nature, and that therefore part of what we would need to do is to recover a relation to nature which is constructive, productive, and, and satisfying. But that doesn't necessarily mean you stop being anthropocentric. It's just that you're anthropocentric in a different way. And I think Marx took the position that we should be anthropocentric, but not in the way that capital is, is doing of exploiting and extracting all of the free gifts of nature and, and treating them with, you know, irresponsibly. Uh, so so there, there is that side, it seems uh, to me, which needs to be considered. And I personally think, yeah, there are certain things that I, where I'm very glad that we've arrived at a point where we can dominate nature. I would like to be able to walk out and have a, an interesting time instead of being locked down, even though my plant as a natural object has actually <laughs> helped me uh, survive. Uh, I, I like that, but, but, but the, the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm really finding is that the, the, the inability to dominate nature uh, and to deal with this virus and, and to find a vaccine and all those kinds of things, we want to do that. I'm very glad that we eradicated smallpox. And I don't find it very comforting when some of my colleagues who are very much into the environmental stuff say, you should be convivial with all of nature. And I kind of say, I don't want to be convivial with a smallpox virus. I don't want to be convivial with, with uh, this coronavirus. In fact, I think that we do need, in some instances, the capacity to eradicate, eradicate and dominate that which is most threatening to our existence and to our lives. So I'm all in favor of, 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 of some of this capacity. But the big question is, to what degree can we engage with the capacity and powers which are developed under scientific capitalism, which is indeed to, 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 to dominate uh, many aspects of the, of the natural world, but to do it, uh, but to, to withdraw from, from those forms of domination which are unnecessary and start to create a world in which the alienation that many of us feel from nature can be recuperated through strategies which are actually anthropocentric in their origins, but which are actually broadly looking at the way in which human beings belong in the system of nature and need to define their position and their situation in relation to, to, to that. So I think that Marx's argument here, uh, which occurs in both of these statements, uh, which is about uh, the, the domination of nature, is, is, is yes, it's, it's said in a way which I think would generally be considered since the Frankfurt School, in fact, in the 1930s and the critique of the domination of nature thesis and all the rest of it, that, that we need uh, an eco-socialist perspective, which is uh, resting upon uh, as much knowledge of the natural world as we possibly can define so that we understand it and we understand it in ways where we can actually do remedial work. Uh, so that the scientific understanding means that 
it gives us some possibilities of engineering control and all the rest of it for, uh, for just for uh, for example refrigeration has been vital to human health uh, the, the food supply systems of large urban areas would have long ago have collapsed were it not for refrigeration and therefore refrigeration is a very important feature which allows our health and our, 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 our well-being uh, to be uh, uh, protected um, by, by that particular technique. But it was found out that refrigerators use chlorofluorocarbons and that CFCs in the atmosphere were actually interacting with other gas gases in the atmosphere in such a way as to create an ozone hole, which allowed, uh, which then created the, the situation of uh, ultraviolet rays Come, you know, hitting Earth uh, unprotectedly, and the South Pole and Australia, New Zealand, were, you know. So now here's a situation where yes, scientific knowledge is is very important. Scientific knowledge created refrigeration. Refrigeration had the unintended consequences of the ozone hole and increasing damage from ultraviolet rays. Uh, upon human population. So we had to do something about CFCs. They had to be displaced and replaced. And so we had the Montreal Co Protocol, which didn't go all of the way, but which, you know, was, uh, was a very important uh, pioneer piece of legislation, which actually talked about uh, the, you know. So this is the kind of approach, it seems to me, that needs to be, needs, needs to be uh, pursued. Marx w was an anthropocentric book for one very, very simple reason, that as a historical materialist, he could never abandon the perspective that all knowledge of the world that, that the human beings have comes out of their experience of the world, their material, social, political, economic, and other in, in experience. And since it comes out of that world, it cannot transcend that world. We cannot have knowledge that is outside of it. We can imagine all sorts of things, and we can, uh, and 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 that that is interesting and fun to do. I mean, uh, the famous uh, anarchist geographer Lise Reclus wrote some wonderful kind of essays of thinking like a mountain, thinking like a stream. So, uh, and, and we can we we can engage in those imaginative exercises, but it's still us who's doing it, and we are expressing what we're thinking in our language. And if we acquire, if you like, attribute moral, moral uh, standing uh, to trees, and if we attribute moral standing uh, to viruses uh, and bats and things, then, or, you know, we, it is still us who are uh, attributing the moral standing. So Mark, from Marx's perspective, we can only ever be anthropocentric. The only interesting question is how we are anthropocentric. And I think it's readily concede, conceded in these passages, if these represent Marx's position, as opposed to Marx describing to us what capital must necessarily do, if this is Marx's position, then it's a position that I think needs to be modified. And actually elsewhere in Marx, you'll find passages where he will talk about unintended consequences of, uh, of human action. He will be talking to some degree about uh, alienation from the natural world. So the, the, there's uh, many clues in Marx to suggest that these, this w w was not his uh, full-blooded uh, uh, consideration of how to understand the metabolic relation to nature. He has uh, many things, but it, here it is expressed in a way which is a bit too strong and very discomforting for me if I kind of would find myself say, well, well, are you committed to this Marxist vision? My answer would be, no, I'm not committed to this Marxist vision. I'm committed very much to Marx's historical materialism, and I would accept the anthropocentrism, and I recognize that there are times when you want to dominate nature. You don't want to, you know, facilitate uh, uh, the, the, the virus, and you don't, uh, virus production, and you don't want to do those, you don't want to engage in chemical warfare and all those kinds of things. So there are, there are many things that, that, that can be said about this. But it is interesting that what he's saying here is that the bourgeois society is one which has to separate nature from culture, and that therefore, and when he's talking about pre-indigenous societies, he's saying, well, here's a world in which uh, the distinction between nature and culture is not there. If they're, they're merged in exactly the same way in a peasant society, 
the relationship between production and consumption is 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 you know they're they're unified uh, and and not externalized. So this is uh, this is part of I think of what uh, of what the way I would want to set this up. And I want in the next talk to sort of go on and try to talk a little bit more about uh, what this might mean uh, for understanding our current conjuncture. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.